<clears throat> okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Um, thank you for attending our session here where Nathan and myself will kind of give you a rundown of building uh, security frameworks into your CI CD pipeline. So a little background. Uh, my name is David Brock. I'm the product manager for the Compose platform here at Allstate. Um, hopefully you guys were able to stop by our booth uh, in the foundry at some point uh, over this conference and get to uh, get a rundown of Compose. Um, I'm here joined by Nathan, who is a senior manager of application security and cloud security with an enterprise group at Allstate. And what we're going to talk to you today is how we are partnering together to kind of bring the enterprise security into what we're doing here with the cloud and how that partnership is allowing us to uh, automate things and build a, a stronger platform. So with that, I'll hand it over to Nathan. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, everyone, thank you for coming here uh, at the end of the conference, um, the last session where security belongs, right at the the very end. <laughs> Appreciate it, um, and you know to to actually talk about here in a little bit how we're going to basically turn Jenkins over to security and and put you know laws into Jenkins. I'm I'm joking. We're actually going to talk to you about that partnership where security is um, actually embedded with the product team and is responsible for uh, being a delivery organization and actually delivering product to market. So um, we're going to go through some of that at some level. We're going to get technical and actually look at some code. Um, I won't go into too much detail on that, but I want to show you guys conceptually how it's done. Um, but we're going to kind of keep it at a high level to show you the full uh, process stripe. So security is a huge domain of topics to get through in about 40 minutes. So um, as uh, Dave mentioned, I'm the senior manager of application cloud security at Allstate. Uh, my background, I've been in security about 16 years, um, and I've been primarily focused in uh, application development in Agile environments, both uh, Scrum and, and XP methodologies. So um, as we go through this, you're going to see some stuff that's kind of, you know, uh, it looks like a Scrum environment. Some of it looks like an XP environment. A lot of it can be applied in either way. So just kind of keep that context at a high level that this is an Agile methodology. So. Okay, so high level, um, this is a process flow uh, with kind of a security perspective, right? You guys are familiar with this. In an agile world, we have um, you know, product managers who are coming up with you know, requirements and acceptance criteria and kind of adding that to a backlog. And then you have the various phases of portfolio prioritization, user story breakouts, whatever it may be, where we're determining what's important and what we're going to work on. And then all the way down to the developer level down here where they're planning and actually coding in five and six. And then seven and eight, this is where we're really going to get in the fun of it. That's where Jenkins at, right? And that's where we're going to get in the meat of continuous audit and continuous inspection. So this is really about how do you get continuous audit added to your continuous integration pipeline. So, and we're going to go through the stack, basically, the journey throughout the presentation. All right, so the first thing is define security, right? <laughs> That's all we hear. That's what I hear a lot from developers. They're just like, you know, what are my security requirements? And security's like, ah, you need to be secure. What does that mean? You know, what does that mean at the uh, operating system level? What does that mean at the infrastructure level? What does that mean at the application level, right? And as we move more and more into a platform society and DevOps, some of those lines start to blur on who's responsible for that, right? So a lot of times, you know, requirements are assumed to be taken care of by your enterprise, you know, infrastructure guys because that's the operating system. But security has no context of containerization. They don't know what Run C is. They don't know what Docker is, right? And that's another layer of abstraction that still needs to have security requirements kind of applied to it. So that's why what David said, the partnership is important because you can't secure something if you don't understand it. And what ends up happening is you have requirements that were originally intended for a traditional environment that don't make sense, but somebody says, ah, you have a firewall in there, that checks the box on the compliance, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're more secure. And that's the biggest difference. There is a difference between being compliant and being secure, right? And I'm interested in being secure. So for security to partner with the developers, actually understand the environment and what controls need to go where so we don't end up with something like this, right? And this is you know, traditional. We run into this all the time of, um, you know, we don't allow our operating systems to talk outbound, um, but, you know, within the, the containers have the ability to, you know, have Jenkins talk outbound and, uh, you know, grab that, that information, pack it into a container and deploy it anyways, bypassing the security controls, which doesn't help the developer or the product or security, right? 
All right, so this is how we define security. I've been in security 16 years. You guys ask me, how do you define security? I'll say, I don't know. Much like your world, it changes every day in my world. You guys have new technologies, new you know, products and services you wanna try out that meets customer needs. The same thing with security. Our threat landscape is constantly changing. Our vulnerabilities are constantly changing. And I can't keep up with it all. These are my problem statements. These are my user stories, right? These are what guides us. And if you guys really think about it, at the end of the day, where do these standards come from? NIST. National Institutes of Standards and Technology. It comes from a law called FISMA, Federal Information Security Management Act. Let's think about where laws come from, right? They're legislatures. Legislators are voted on by the people. And the people themselves, at some point in time, were concerned about the security of their data and the companies that were you know, supposed to be entrusted for taking care of their data, and that wasn't happening. So the people, not through a product manager, but the people through their legislators, um, came up with these various standards or asked the legislator to work to come up with these various standards. These are user stories. These are user acceptance criteria. They're not compliance. So if we change our mindset a little bit and think about these as this is the voice of our customer. It's an unspoken voice. It's a, 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 an expected voice. We're not gonna directly ask for the security requirements, but that's all they are. They're still requirements from our users. And we're gonna take you down into turning these into code. All right, so the first step is up here where we have uh, product managers, you know, kind of looking at what that acceptance criteria is, what the feature of a minimum viable product is, right? I'm gonna take you the key with viable for a customer includes security, right? So how do we define security within that viable MVP? Um, and the definition of that. And that's what's missing. And a lot of what I see in the enterprise is security's at the tail end. When you're just getting ready to go to production, you're just getting ready to release, you have all your commitments, you have everything lined up, you think you're set, then you have your pen test. Then you have your vulnerability scan. Then you have whatever it may be. And you're, that's when you find out that there's a whole bunch of stuff missing. We need to figure out how to get that to the front end of the pipe. And how you do that is through partnership, having security be a product delivery organization. Be there at your inceptions, at your user story breakouts. Uh, defining scope for minimum viable product. And that's the first phase we're going to talk about. This is a user story right here. Given when then, right? Gherkin syntax. So those laws, those standards, NIST, COBIT, whatever it may be, those are problem statements that you can actually translate into that Gherkin syntax and put into a given when then statement. And here in a minute, you're gonna see how really powerful this is if you couple this with test-driven development. But in this case, we have a basic you know, privacy system message. Everyone saw that, you know, I've seen that. You have to have privacy policy, whatever it may be, that we're gonna collect X, Y, and Z information from you. And down here, this thing doesn't have a laser, and I'm sorry for the resolution, but down here, you'll see that this is mapped to NIST controls. So in this particular case, it's NIST AC 3, 4, 5, and 6, right? So we're actually giving a user story, mapping it back to a compliance requirement. So when that gets down to the developer, and the first thing I want to talk about, I guess we'll step back. We have user stories for the application. We can have user stories for the, or for the operating system or the container, right? In this case, we're talking about actually you know, providing a denial of service attack um, a story at the network level. And then you can have one for the database. So sorry for resolution. The point here is not to go through every NIST control because that's super boring. Um, I enjoy that, but I also get to turn it into code. So that's what makes it fun for me. But in this case, you have all kinds of acceptance criteria for the definition of a secure database right inside these NIST controls. All right, so now the, the other big thing is when you get into documentation, right? How many people have heard, where's your governance documents? Where's your standards? Where are your policies, your procedures, right? Those aren't you know, traditionally things that XP or Agile Scrum teams are delivering. Um, one would think. But in reality, you guys are creating a lot of readmes. You're creating a lot of documentation for how you go about doing things to make sure it's predictable, repeatable. That's the name of Agile, right? Is you want to be lean, fast, 
um, automated, and a lot of it's predictable, repeatable. Well, those documentations, whether they're developer docs, readme, whatever it may be, those actually constitute um, governance and compliance documents. So um, your API docs is another one, right? Those are standards for how to interface with your application in a secure way. Um, and a lot of people don't think that those map directly to those NIST controls, which are usually the first two in every NIST family as a policy or a procedure or a standard. You're creating those. You just got to you know, get a security person that's part of that product delivery team to put a pretty wrapper around that and actually communicate that to internal audit, to your security team, whoever it may be. All right, so we're going to get down into the actual paying attention time. Uh, we're going to get down to the actual uh, iteration planning, right? So this is where the developers, they have the user stories from all the product managers, and we've mapped that back to the NIST controls, or COVID, or PCI, or HIPAA, whatever it may be, right? All these laws are just user stories. We're going to get into TDD. So if we actually take the feature that comes from NIST um, that the user has requested through us, it just came through a law, and actually map it back to a NIST requirement and start to identify the feature, the background, scenario. This is part of test-driven development. Again, this is business language, right? So this is something that an auditor can look at. This is something that um, your internal security people can look at. And if you guys, how many of you guys are familiar with fitness or Cucumber, uh, BDD-driven framework? So that's what I'm about to walk you guys through. So this is business-driven development here. Um, we're actually taking those, those laws and those standards and turn them into BDD. So this is the next phase, right? So we're getting down into actual executable code. Um, and the next slide, we'll talk about it. And I just want to give you guys a chance to look at this. So we went from this high-level business statement. We're taking it a step down, right? Working on the step test at this point. And then finally, what you end up with is an actual functioning code that's mapped back to a NIST standard. So how often, how powerful do you guys do you think this is? From, a, from an Agile perspective. If I'm a waterfall organization, and I asked you the last time you had a NIST audit, you have a compliance audit, they're gonna say, oh, last quarter. Say, oh, maybe last year. Last quarter, best case scenario, because those things take forever. Guess what the Scrum, XP, Agile guys get to do? I had a build that ran five minutes ago. Here's all 635 tests that are associated and mapped back to NIST or PCI or HIPAA or whatever it may be, and here's my build that it's green. And more importantly, your standard audits, those are point in time pieces of paper. They do nothing to prevent insecure or uncompliant code to get to production. But in this scenario, if somebody writes some code later on that you know, happens to violate some security tenant that we had previously defined that was an acceptance criteria or whatever it may be, it'll break the build and prevent that from going to production. And that's powerful, that is a super powerful thing to be able to attest to and to be able to talk to. Oops, sorry about that. This is just another example of a unit test. It's kind of mapped back to a NIST control up top using tagging. That's the other thing you can do is kind of search your code and actually report on how many tests and what NIST controls that they're mapping back to. So continuous audit on the platform. Have you guys heard for CIS benchmarks? So I'll give a little bit of background, yes. <laughs> I'll give a little background on that. So um, we get a lot of questions from a security. What's the definition of a secure Ubuntu image? What's the definition of a secure Windows image? You know, what's the definition of a secure Red Hat or secure Nginx, whatever it may be, right? And there's a, a group of um, professionals in the security industry, I'm one of them, that kind of participate and collaborate um, to define what those standards are. Now, are they perfect? No, they're meant to be more of a guideline. But at the end of the day, you have a CIS benchmark standard for um, you know, defining what a secure uh, image would look like or a secure you know, uh, web hosting platform may, may look like. And I've heard rumors that there may be some stuff going on um, specific to Cloud Foundry on that, but we'll see in the future how that goes. But in this case, you have um, uh, Centers for Information Security that have actually defined those benchmarks. And what's cool is with the advent of Chef, Puppet, Ansible, um, 
people have actually taken those, those PDFs or those XML files that are published by uh, um, CAS and put those into executable Ruby or Python or code, whatever it is that you're, you're using, Chef, Puppet, or Ansible, and you can automate um, the deployment of, of a secure uh, operating system. And couple that with something like Test Kitchen, you can actually, again, provide test-driven development against your operating system infrastructure and your platform infrastructure as well, not just the application. So um, I'm going to pass it off. So I've talked a lot. I'm going to pass it off to uh, Dave a little bit to talk to you about on our uh, uh, Cloud Foundry platform how we're actually putting this stuff into play. Yeah, thanks, Nathan. So um, in this scene here, you see a red build. Um, but what you're seeing is a automated scan of a stem cell that was pushed to PivNet. It was pulled down, pushed to a null build pack in Bosch. Um, and we have some configuration to give a user. And then using a Ruby gem that, that we partnered with um, Nathan to provide us, we're able to do a scan of that stem cell and actively see the results. Now, this you see there are some failures, but the other thing that we're partnering with is not everything that it's identified as a failure makes sense in this cloud environment. So we'll work to define a filter so that as these builds come up, we're notified of the things that matter in our environment, and then we can choose to push to the rest of the, the environment. And at that time, we now have documentation that this was done and it passed, or it failed, and we know why. Um, so this is something we're actively doing and we're expanding because not only are we interested in doing this for the applications that run on Cloud Foundry, but the platform itself. Thanks, Dave. And I'll talk to you a little bit about um, how we're doing that. And, and again, Dave, the, the Cloud Foundry expert, you can kind of pull that together. But um, the security tools in the security industry um, are evolving just like your tools are, right? So they have APIs. Security department may not know that or know what APIs are, but as we move into this uh, more continuous integration, continuous automate, uh, you know, continuous deployment environment, you can leverage Jenkins to call your static analysis tools, to call your uh, vulnerability uh, tools, to call Metasploit, automated pen testing frameworks, right, and produce artifacts on the fly and give developers real time feedback and also break the build, obviously, if new uh, new vulnerabilities are introduced. Um, I will caution on that, just to let you guys know, is these tools are also um, getting feeds, obviously, from the vendors themselves. So a developer may check in code um, to uh, add you know, a widget, whatever it may be, that they want to add to the site. And at the same time, a new public vulnerability um, has been detected and published by the vendor, right? And the developer happens to commit the code just at that time, as the signatures came down, and the build breaks but no fault of the developer, it's because of maybe a third party library you know, that's sitting in their code, some vulnerability that was detected in Spring. So you need to have the framework on the back end to provide for exceptions, and those can be as simple as you know, a, a, a JSON template that's documenting exceptions within the source code that you know, just requires a simple pull request um, uh, for a developer to update to get their build green, and just make sure you add something to the backlog that can be prioritized like everything else um, to go back and fix that, you know, vulnerability that you found, um, or that the, uh, the security tool found. So those are kind of some of the more difficult things because your security people traditionally, oh, you have a vulnerability, no, don't deploy. You can be like, you have a 30-day patching cycle. I have a two-week patching cycle because I can get it into my next sprint. So, you know, I'm still going to deploy this code because I didn't introduce that vulnerability. So those are the type of conversations you need to have, and it's just an educational journey is really what it is. So, so we're going to get into a little bit uh, box seven and eight. This is where the uh, continuous audit comes in. It's really about hooking these various security tools up to Jenkins. Um, one of the things I want to talk about, and Dave will talk a little bit about, is um, how we're... Uh, utilizing Diploidactyl, which I'll let Dave talk about that, and coupled with uh, uh, security standards such as OWASP and NIST to, to actually provide this automated gating um, protocol, as well as many other things in our CI/CD pipe. So, talk a little bit about Diploidactyl. Yeah, so I know it was announced last year, but um, if you have not checked it out, you should. Diploidactyl is a tool that we've written and contributed to open source. Um, check out our GitHub project. Uh, that allows for automated deployment, blue-green deployments to multiple foundations. Now, our architecture is very complex, so having a developer have to 
deploy to each of our foundations and check them and worry about change records and all that is just a lot of overhead and burden that they don't need to worry about. Deploy Dactyl is our solution to that. It allows for blue-green deployment across multiple foundations so that they know that they're, they've got the environment running exactly how they should um, across the entire production environment. So as Nathan's talking about is we can leverage that and extend that, have Deploy Dactyl or Conveyor and interact with other components and and other security tools to bring those in and, and provide that validation as well. Yep, so uh, internally, just to make sure I don't get the names uh, crossed, we call Deploy Dactyl Conveyor internally. So as you hear me talk about Conveyor, that's essentially what Deploy Dactyl is. But, um, so my team came in and kind of you know, worked with uh, the platform team to kind of identify and really understand, again, the environment and how things are being deployed so we don't create you know, a gate that just <laughs> kind of has things going around it. And identified that Deploy Dactyl really looks like a centralized, centralized point that is responsible for, for deploying over their Cloud Foundry infrastructure, right? So how powerful would it be to leverage Deploy Dactyl to basically go off and check to see if the appropriate security artifacts were in place, um, either required from a compliance perspective, again, I don't like that because I'm more looking at risk, um, uh, or you know, from a security perspective, um, that, that the minimum acceptable risk has not been um, exceeded before Deploy Dactyl or Conveyor pushes that out over the production um, uh, instance. So in this case, Case, we're, we're hooking Deploy Dactyl up with, with various tools. So the first thing I want to talk about is, is, is uh, licensing, right? So how many people dealt with in an enterprise, you know, legal and different people, you know, concerned about Apache versus MIT, things like that, right? It's a, a very difficult conversation. Uh, developers, uh, you know, need to move fast. They don't have time to sit through and read every piece of code. So we've got some open source technology, or I'm sorry, we've got some commercial vended technologies like Black Duck that has the ability for Deploy Dactyl to actually reach out and validate that there are not any licenses that, you know, um, violate the existing licenses for, um, uh, the enterprise, and that can be hooked right up with Artifactory Pro as well to be used when a developer is trying to pull down um, uh, that software. Uh, the other thing uh, that can be used, if you want to do more of an open source cheaper route, we have things like Maven um, that is already doing a lot of this information, right? So um, through some creative scripting, whether Python or whatever you like to write, we can actually start to produce those artifacts and store them in a central location and ask Conveyor to deploy a Dactyl to check that that exists and parse that, whatever it may be, right? So that's really how we start taking these traditionally manual processes where legal, whoever had to review these things and you know, manually approve or sign off on some form and try to and start to automate that within your um, CI CD pipe. The next thing is automated pen testing. So anybody familiar with W3AF? Yeah. So uh, W3F is a pretty powerful dynamic analysis um, tool. Um, it does require a little bit of upfront um, uh, configuration for each application because each application is a little bit unique. Uh, but the developers themselves and the Scrum team partnered with a security person can basically create a configuration for their application and store it in their source code. And when they go to deploy to production, again, you can have W3F running inside a Docker container that you basically pass command line to along with that configuration file and say, hit my application. Let me know if I introduce any new vulnerability. And if I do, give me immediate feedback. So this is where you start to really get automated pen testing uh, built into your CI CD pipe. And again, you can have Deploy Dactyl check for the results of this and either say, hey, they did it, or um, hey, it found vulnerabilities, don't deploy. Uh, so there's any number of scenarios gradually over time that you can introduce. You don't have to break the build day one. In fact, I encourage you not to break the build day one, right? Hook these things up, start gathering some stats and some data. It should be a development tool and useful for the developers before you start breaking the developer's pipeline because <laughs> uh, they really need to understand what's happening and more importantly, how to fix it or who they can go to for help. The next thing is a vulnerability scanner. And this one's probably one of my more passionate things because people traditionally think a vulnerability scanner is just gonna find vulnerabilities, but it's much more powerful than that. A vulnerability scanner has the uh, ability to actually get into your box and, and really profile it and create artifacts on, a, on a, a number of different things that are important to security and compliance and, and the product manager. Um, you can create and automatically profile the users that are on the system and, and create that with every build and maybe do diffs in between them to identify 
identify if new users you know, have been added for whatever reason. You can do it for the groups and the users that are in the groups. A list of all the installed software, you know, RPMs, Debian package, whatever it may be, um, and uh, bad configuration. Again, your vulnerability scanner, those CIS standards that we talked about, your vulnerability scanner can really measure you and compare you um, and score you against those CIS standards and give you information on what ones you're meeting and what ones you're not. Don't have time. Okay, good. Okay, the next thing is um, not many auditors, not many security people are not gonna wanna go to Jenkins you know, to view all these artifacts, right? Um, in fact, they get questions all the time, what is Jenkins? You try to explain it, it's just, you're not gonna get anywhere. These are tools that they're used to seeing things in. So RSA Archer is a, what they call a GRC tool, governance, risk, and compliance tool, where um, from a security standpoint, we can load those templates for those laws that we talked about, NIST, um, uh, COBIT, whatever it may be. And it's an easy way for them to map requirements from a, a legal compliance perspective over to solutions, and then also measuring those solutions effectiveness, right? What are artifacts that we're testing, proving that they're in place and they're not being exploited, whatever it may be. Again, tools like this are coming out with APIs. Your security people may not know that, your compliance people may not know that, and, and again, we know what APIs are and how to integrate with that. So all these artifacts we talked about, we've been talking about giving a developer view for right now. But if the tail end of your pipe, right before you deploy, you can work to deploy that artifact or test or whatever it may be out to RSA Archer. Um, again, you're giving them a real time feed into residual risk, something that they've never had before. They're used to every quarter doing an assessment or some sort of penetration test, and that's a best case scenario. A lot of times it's a year because pen testing teams you know, are not very big and they're usually backlogged in an enterprise environment. So if you can start to automate some of the stuff that they do and then take the results that they usually manually upload through a UI interface and start to automate that with Jenkins, now you're starting to give them something they have never had before and it's a real time view into residual risk at the enterprise at multiple levels, not just the application but the infrastructure um, as well as the operating system layer. This is just a view uh, from RSA Archer. And uh, again, this is what they're used to seeing with their compliance and their scores and everything like that. As you guys begin to add those artifacts, um, they're starting to get a dynamic view, which will really change their operations at that point. And to be honest, they're gonna start getting a live stream of data that's gonna force them to figure out how to be a little bit more agile, right? Um, at this point, they're saying, hey, we're not getting data, they're not producing artifacts, but as you start to give that more and more, it's like, okay, now I have two much information, how do I deal with this? How do I start to do agile risk management, agile risk assessment, which that is a really cool place to be for an organization. So something I'm working on and a couple things, I forgot to mention this earlier. So um, the, the gem that they are using um, uh, for hooking up into deploy, deploy a dactyl, um, it's uh, specifically for Rapid7 Nexpos. So if you guys have uh, Rapid7 Nexpos within your organization, um, there's a gem out there called the Nexpos Runner um, that you can actually download. Um, and uh, it's basically command line access that allows you uh, to uh, do automated vulnerability scans. In this case, it's another one. Um, we've taken the actual whole NIST um, 853, which is about 385 security controls, and actually you know, JSONified that whole thing. And that becomes really powerful. If you guys are in a situation that you have to create system security plans um, and different things like that, you can actually start automating Jenkins to populate the different controls, which are essentially your artifacts um, from your build, and producing automated system security plans. So. Oop, I don't know what's happening here. Well, it's just jumping. So anyways, that's where we're at. Um, if you guys have any questions, we're welcome. Um, we've actually got a full crew of Allstate people here that can talk to you as well. Uh, so thank you for your time, Dave. Yeah, so uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, we'd love to hear your questions or talk to you, see what you, see what you got, yeah.
still keep the speed you know, reasonable? Yeah. Yeah, so just to repeat everyone if you didn't hear what he said, basically he, he's saying that the, the timing of some of these scans take a while to run, especially like W3F and sometimes our static analysis. And how do you keep up with the pace of velocity, continuous deployment, while developers have to sit and wait for a scan to get in place? And he's absolutely right. That's a challenge that we deal with. And uh, one of the things, I guess, from our perspective that we're looking at is what are the tests that we can run um, up front that are really, really quick um, and have those be part of basically you know, automated gating to get into production. And what ones take a little bit longer that we're gonna run after the fact, right? Um, and and uh, things like a, a fuzzer, for example, I didn't talk too much about a fuzzer, but sometimes a fuzzer can take days to run depending on the size of the application. That isn't necessarily needed for um, uh, all applications. One of the approaches you can take is if you have, you know, uh, one of the things in this is to kind of classify your systems. You know, this system is a, a highly critical application to the organization. You may have a different policy and process for changes for that application saying, ah, it may require a fuzzer just because of the sensitivity of that application. Where systems that maybe not are as sensitive as that one, um, we do that after the fact, after the deploy and basically true up if it finds anything at that point. And I think that's individual with each organization and kind of the risk tolerance. So, um, and, and then within the company, you're gonna have a different risk tolerance based off the type of application. Um, so not always are you gonna run every single test, I guess is the answer, it's up to, to each group. So, yes sir? I love it. <laughs> That's where good ideas come from. Automating just security, like fuzzing, all sorts of scanning. I like being kind of meticulous and forcing developers to build SpiderDoc with the JSON file. Are there any like enterprise quality security tools that will take a SpiderDoc input and do all of the fuzzing, all that wonderful stuff automatically? SpiderDoc. I may not be Oh, oh, swagger documentation. Yeah. Um, wow, I don't know the answer to that question from a fuzzing perspective. So traditionally, um, what what a fuzzer is going to do is uh, uh, look at your inputs, uh, either through APIs or, or on um, the application itself, and just nail it with an obscene amount of garbage to try and get 500s and stuff like that. So, yeah, so you took swagger and set that as the input to the fuzzer, so we can just figure out what all your inputs were. Huh. Yeah, I had not thought of that, so um, I'd like to follow up with you on that, I guess, after this, so. Good question. Yeah, I, and I don't, yeah, I'm learning every day, and to be honest, you know, everything that you guys see up here is because of partnering with developers, sitting next to them, and being open-minded enough to say, Yes, I've done this t this way for 10 years now and throwing that away and just saying, okay guys, teach me Jenkins, teach me, you know, whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, conversations like this is where this has been derived from. And it's not perfect, it's still a work in progress. Um, there, there are times where, you know, still today that, that uh, we're challenged together and getting better at it, so, yes? So at what point in pipeline are you handling like integration contracts and things outside of the foundation or you know other things like let's say you're constructing RDS instances as part of a release and you want to make sure like certain controls with those components are being met. Um, how do you handle those? So yeah, we're obviously working on that, that journey and figuring out some of those things as we speak right now. But what you're getting into is kind of like software-defined infrastructure <laughs> at that point, right? And um, in, in this case, Jenkins could and should still be used to control that, that RDS, right? Amazon has APIs um, uh, just like everything else, and that should be a software-defined deployment. And if you do that, you can actually you know, create test-driven infrastructure at that point to look for certain configurations from MySQL.com that's stored in, in the source code that, that your Jenkins job uses to, to create RDS. So um, the same concept you see here apply for the, the database, you know, user stories and everything. Um, if you're using software-defined infrastructure to deploy to the cloud, this should still work, and it has. I can speak to it that I've done it before. Now I'm relatively new at Allstate, um, and we're going through that journey here, so I'm gonna learn a new way to do it. I guarantee it won't be done the same way that I've done it in the past, but. Yeah, that test-driven infrastructure is really powerful. Uh, yes, sir? Question on, basically, I know that you're running for Allstate, right? So Allstate is an insurance company and all. So 
looking at all these different technologies out there, how do you convince a, a business user by having all sort of an open source technology out there for the business? You know, who come from like you know those days, open source is always insecure. You know, there's a lot of uh, loopholes and stuff. And then the security on the other side is to say it's closed down, locked down, and you know don't open up. But the other side is open source. You know, make it free. Yeah. So how do you? Yeah, so it's a definitely a balance, like you said. Security's got certain objectives, and I think one of the challenges is more of a communication and education on what are the problem statements we're trying to solve with that, and then security at the same time, what are your problem statements? So outcome-driven stuff, not solution statements like this is what we've done all the time. So um, that that challenge is, is real, so to speak, right? And it's really going back, and, and when you see people talking about solution statements or um, you know specific implementations, to drive it back to a problem statement. And and at the end, what you'll end up with is um, most of the time some hybrid in between that most people aren't either side is going to be comfortable with, but over time they get more comfortable with it because it's a fear of the unknown. Once the unknown becomes less of an unknown, uh, then people kind of buy on board and continue to evolve and grow that. But in the beginning, yes, it's very challenging. Um, but it's really about problem statements and acceptance criteria more than solution statements and expectations, I guess. So. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks.